and welcome to day three of Maths Week TV. We've had a fabulous response so far. Already we have over 355,000 students registered by their teachers as taking part in Maths Week. So well done everybody. We have had such wonderful creativity and imagination seen in schools all across the island. So a big shout out to all the teachers who have worked with their students uh, to create such wonderful maths inspiring activities. So keep sending out your, uh, your posts on Twitter and Facebook and let us know what you're doing for Maths Week. We're delighted to have St. Mary's Charleville and Drimna Castle here as our audience <coughs> for our show uh, this morning. Um, we just get on to the main event now. We have Rob Eastaway, who's the very first presenter in Maths Week. Uh, over 15 years ago, Rob came down yeah. to Waterford, uh, where he did a show for some school, secondary schools in Waterford, and out of that came the idea of Maths Week Ireland. So we've come a long way since then, Rob. So <laughs> Rob is a mathematician, an author, and broadcaster. His show Puzzling Surprises, which is what he's going to share with us today. It's going to present entertaining examples of counterintuitive maths from Pythagoras to Pascal's triangles. So hand it over to Rob. Right. Thank you, Sheila. Hello, everyone. I can see if I can uh, share my screen. So um, and um, can you see that now? And sorry if any words get clipped off uh, at times. Sheila, you can be my guide as to whether um, uh, anything's missing there but my name is Rob Eastaway and um, uh, as you heard I spend some of my time writing books and I love maths of everyday life and and also puzzles so that's kind of going to be a theme for this talk for you uh, this morning and um, uh, I've called it puzzling surprises because I think the part of maths that I've always enjoyed is the stuff that is surprising. Uh, I've, maths is full of that. You don't always get to see that in the school curriculum. Um, and I'm also really interested in psychology and the fact that we have as people this thing called intuition. Sometimes you'll see a problem and your intuition is the thing that tells you the answer with it, without you having to think. And normally intuition works really well, but sometimes our intuition goes wrong. And what's called counterintuitive really uh, interests me. So. I'm actually going to be showing you four puzzles during this talk um, and if you manage to score better than zero out of four you're beating me. Every one of these puzzles when I first saw them I got them wrong and I'm going to tell you why sometimes getting it wrong in maths is fine. I'm, not, I'm sure that's not how you normally think of it um, but you'll see what I mean as we go along. So um, here's the first of my four puzzles and this is the basketball puzzle. I'm sure uh, many of you have played basketball, maybe at school, maybe out in the park or whatever. You've all seen uh, a basketball and a basketball hoop. So here's my puzzle for you. Um, I want you to imagine looking from above, watching a basketball pass through the hoop. Which of the following is the most accurate representation, is the right ratio of basketball to hoop? Is it A, B, C, or D. So um, what would be quite fun here is if maybe teachers could take a quick straw poll and enter an estimate of how many people are voting for A or B or C or D and stick that in the chat. Um, and Sheila, if you can give me some indication, because I can't see the chat from the particular view I've got here, um, you can tell me what the spread of answers is for that A, B, C or D. Okay, Rob, we're getting C. Getting C, I see some, some hands going up. So there's some spread of anything apart from C. So, or is that is that dominating the- uh, Yeah, dom C, is, C is dominating. <laughs> okay, with a, with a bit of others, right. Yeah, I think that's, um, a lot of people say C, um, sometimes B. Right, I'm gonna show you the right answer. And I think this is gonna surprise a lot of people. Um, actually, out of curiosity, Sheila, did you have a guess? Oh, I don't hear anything from Sheila. I'm going to show you the answer. Um, Sorry. Here we go. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just saying I'm not very good at basketball, so I was picking <laughs> <to do. laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, here you go. Correct answer is A. And I don't know if anyone guessed A. Sometimes one or two people guess A. A lot of people say that cannot be right. Why is it almost everyone gets this wrong? Let me show you um, the dimensions. This is the inside diameter of a basketball hoop, 46 centimeters. And here is a basketball, 24. And 24 is about half, just over half, 46. Um, so we all get it wrong. And I got it wrong. Um, and this is called the basketball hoop illusion. And there's three reasons why people get it wrong. And the first one is the net, because as the ball passes through, notice how the net tapers down. So the ball seems to squeeze through, creates the impression of it squeezing through the hoop. Um, the second thing, of course, is uh, for most of us, scoring a basket is quite hard. And so we miss a lot. And being human beings, we assume that's because uh, the, the hoop must be small rather than because we're not very good. Um, and the third thing is this strange effect whereby we find it very hard to judge the size of things that are above us uh, at, in an elevated position. It applies in lots of situations. For example, road signs. How big is that road sign? If I asked you to make it, you'd probably make it maybe a bit taller than you and you know, the, the wall of your classroom, but actually a typical road sign might be taller than a house. They are much bigger. So in a way that's part, that's, uh, that's as much psychology as it is maths. But um, anyway, there's, that was my first puzzle. Um, here is my second one. And you'll notice how I love everyday life examples. So this is a real, another real world puzzle. And it's the dictionary puzzle. Uh, and I've got uh, on my shelf somewhere, a two volume illustrated dictionary. And I'll just give you the dimensions. Um, oh, the, the A to M volumes on the left and the N to Z is on the right, just like you'd expect on a normal bookshelf. Um, each book is about five centimeters thick and the covers are two, two millimeters thick. So I want you to imagine putting bookmarks in at Aardvark and Zebra and I want you to have a guess how far apart, or have an estimate, how far apart you think the two bookmarks are to the nearest millimeter. So how far apart, given all of those dimensions, um, if someone's got a suggestion, stick it in the chat. There might be a range of answers, but uh, when you've got one or two answers through, uh, Sheila, give me a... Excuse me. We're getting one answer of 90 millimetres. 90, so nine centimetres ish. Yeah. OK, you often get 96 or, you know, or people, sometimes people think, oh, is there a trick here? Do you mean the covers are on the outside of the five centimetres or whatever? But there's no trick. But let me tell you something. And you might be expecting this. Not only um, it does it sound like no one's got the right answer. In fact, no one's even close to the right answer if everyone's in the reach of nine or 10 centimeters. Uh, and this is gonna surprise a lot of you. There's no trick here, but let me animate the books to show you uh, where Aardvark and Zebra are. Okay, so here they are. Let's take the first book off the shelf. Let's find Aardvark, there it is, good. And let's put in a bookmark, close it up and put it back on the shelf. OK, so I wonder if most of you are expecting the bookmark to be at the back of the book on the left hand side, because A is at the front, which is on the right. And if we take off the other dictionary, find zebra, put it back. So <laughs> Z is actually on the left, aardvark's on the right and we zoom in, it's about four millimeters. Five millimeters will do. If anyone got that right, give yourself a huge pat on the back. Why do we get that wrong? I suppose it's because we kind of think we know how books work. Just goes to show sometimes something can seem really obvious, but actually we're making assumptions about the world. Sometimes, you know, anyone who sort of said four millimeters of the answer might have been an outlier and everyone else saying, don't be so stupid. And actually it turns out you were right. So. I love this example for saying, never take anything for granted. The world is not always quite as obvious as we think. So um, 
There we go. That's my dictionary puzzle. Right. Next one is the bunting puzzle. And this is based on a sort of semi-true story about my local football team. Uh, I live in South London and my team is called Dulwich Hamlet. They're like in the sixth, sixth tier of football. But they did get promoted a couple of years ago. And uh, here they are. That's when they got promoted. And the thought was, for our final home game, let's celebrate by putting some bunting up on the pitch and the team will come under the bunting and get clapped onto the pitch. So here's the pitch. And the idea was to uh, tie bunting between the two corner flags and lift it up in the middle and the team would come in under the bunting. Now, the pitch is about 100 metres long and the manager sent the assistant off to the DIY shop to buy some bunting. And he came back with 101 metres of flags. And the manager was thinking, I wonder if that is going to be enough if we have the bunting pinned to the bottom of the flags and the corners. So here is your question. It's another multiple choice question. Do you think the players will only just be able to get their fingers underneath the bunting? Or will they be able to crawl underneath? Or will they be able to get underneath if they crouch? Or will they be able to comfortably walk underneath? Now, I maybe one or two of you want to do some calculations. Don't worry about calculating. Just what's your, what's your intuition telling you here? What feels like it is the right answer? A, B, C or D? Have a think about it. You can always ask your neighbour, see if they agree. But um, put in some answers and I'll give ask Sheila to, to give me a sense of what the balance of answers is. I su suspect they might be spread across a few answers here. Yeah, we're getting A, C and D. <coughs> A, C, D? Yeah. A any Bs? Yes, we just got a B in as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, normally, it's pretty evenly spread, actually. So the good news is somebody's definitely got it right this time. Um, <laughs> the question is, who is it? Um, and, for example, I can see why people might say A, because it's like 101 metres, that extra metre spread over 100. It's like hardly any space, at, you know, there's, there's hardly any um, room to, to spread it all out. So, you you know, it's going to be very tight. But others saying, oh, no, maybe there's a bit more slack. Well, I'll tell you what the right answer is. The right answer is D. Uh, the players can comfortably walk underneath. But actually, it's more amazing than that, as I'm about to show you. Um, right, here is a, a diagram. And uh, half a pitch is 50 metres. Half the bunting is 50.5. So what we've got here is a triangle. And I'm sure a lot of you have been working with triangles as part of your lessons. They're not always the most thrilling things, but I think this is a great example of a triangle because we're having to work out how tall it is. Uh, and to do that, uh, I'm guessing most of you have already discovered the method of working out the side of a triangle, right angle triangle, uh, using Pythagoras. So here we have a real life example of Pythagoras in action. Um, so we know that 50.5 squared is equal to 50 squared plus the question mark squared. So I'm just going to rearrange that because we want to know what question mark is. Uh, here are the numbers. 2550, 2500 equals 50.25. So the height is the square root of 50, which is about 7.1 meters. That's really quite tall. In fact, not only can the players walk underneath the bunting, they could get onto the top deck of the team bus, stand on the top and wave to the crowd and still comfortably fit underneath the bunting, which I find really surprising and counterintuitive. I was not expecting Pythagoras theorem to have any surprises but there is one if you so if you got that wrong you're in good company I definitely got it wrong and uh, even the people who said d you might be surprised at just how high that will go um and there is a real world uh, consequence of this um because 150 years ago when they were building <coughs> railways across the state the United States for the first time they'd build these long straight stretches pinned down 
in straight lines across the desert, fantastic, until they got hot. Because when metal gets hot, it expands. And if it's got no way of expanding lengthways, there's only one direction it can go, which is sideways. And it only takes a very small lengthways displacement, like the extra length of bunting, to lead to a huge sideways displacement. So you get things like this. This is called buckling. That rail track is completely ruined because uh, the tracks have had to move sideways. So that is Pythagoras in action. So watch out. You never know what, what, when Pythagoras might crop up in, uh, in a real life situation. Um, so, so far, everything I've talked about has been real world uh, physical examples. I'm going to show you one of my favourite puzzling surprises from something a little bit more um, abstract, which is Pascal's triangle. Um, now, some of you will have come across this. Um, it's, it tends to come up in later maths. So if you haven't, I'm going to just introduce it to you. Uh, here is, <coughs> excuse me, here is Pascal's triangle, um, which is a, a a lovely uh, sequence of numbers or a little pattern of numbers, starting with one at the top, one, one in the next row. And the idea is to make a row of Pascal's triangle, you, well, you put ones at the end, but otherwise you, each number is the sum of the two numbers above it, above left and above right. So the next row goes one, two, one. Okay, the next row is one at the end, and then one and two is three, three, one. So there is Pascal's triangle. There's the next row and the next, and so it goes on. And it turns out, as well as being quite a pretty triangle, it uh, has some uses in things like probability when you're doing that uh, in your later uh, schooling life. But Pascal's triangle also has lots of patterns buried within it. For example, if you add up the numbers in the rows, um, you'll see they go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, those are the powers of two. They're doubling each time, um, which is kind of neat. Um, but there's other numbers in there too. Uh, for example, if you take that diagonal, I don't know if any of you recognize those numbers, one, three, six, ten. 10. Um, I like to call them the snooker numbers or the uh, um, pool numbers, but triangular numbers. So one, three, six, ten, fifteen. 10, 15, those are numbers formed uh, form triangles. Um, and lots of other patterns are, are buried in Pascal's triangle as well. But um, I want you to concentrate on something that might seem a bit more boring, which is that some of the numbers are odd and some of the numbers are even. So uh, let's just extend Pascal's triangle down a bit. So there's 14 rows. And here is your puzzle. And I'll just give you a few moments to think about this. Uh, and again, submit some answers. So I want you to imagine a million rows of Pascal's triangle. So keep on going for a million rows. So it's massive. In a Pascal's triangle with a million rows, what proportion of the numbers in the whole triangle are going to be odd numbers? If you looked at all the numbers and took the ratio of what proportion are odd versus even. So do you think it will be? 67% to the nearest percent. We're rounding this to the nearest percent. 67%, uh, which is two thirds. 50%, so it'll be about half. A third, a quarter, or zero. Okay, so A, B, C, D, or E. Now, I hope you can see the numbers. They're a bit small at the bottom, but that just gives you a, a sample of, of what uh, Pascal's triangle looks like. So have a look at those and maybe come up with a um what you what feels like it might be the right answer because it's amazing how um so many number patterns do end up at a simple fraction when you go far enough so is it going to be two thirds half third quarter zero a b c d or e and sheila let me know if uh, anyone has a punt at some answers okay we have uh one answer of b 50 percent and okay. we have one answer of a 67 and okay. we're just waiting to get some more in now. We have a, we have another one of a 67%. So we're going for, going for higher rather than the lower end. Okay. 
no C's or D's yet. There might be individuals, of course, a bit hard to, not everyone can enter their, their answer. Of course, those of you who are watching this uh, and can't poll, you might just be liking to think. Um, I'm trying to think what the most common answer is. Um, probably B or C, I think, 50% or 33%. Don't know if you've seen any of those. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got two in, one from Drimna Castle on 50%. Okay. And um, yeah, we've another one on 50% as well. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll find out um, if anyone's got it right this time. But I'm going to go on a slight detour before I come back to this. Right. Here is a red triangle. I want you to imagine a lovely wall that you've painted, um, painted red. So it, you, the area is we've painted with red paint. And around the edge, we've used some chalk to draw the perimeter. Um, so here's a bit of chalk. I don't know if you can see that little chalk piece coming around. So, um, so we've used one tin of red paint to paint it and one piece of chalk to draw the perimeter. But we don't want to paint so much. We're, I, I, I'm going to take some of this wall out. So I'm going to just take out this equilateral triangle from inside. So there's less to paint. So I don't need as much paint now. I only need three quarters of a tin. But can you see I need more chalk? So at the moment, well, originally there were like six units of chalk. I've added three more. So there's now nine instead of six. So the perimeter has increased. It's now one and a half, three over two. But actually, I don't want to paint that much either. I'm going to take away some of that. In fact, I'll take away a quarter of each of those red triangles. So now we've got three quarters of three quarters of a tin. Less paint, that's great. But we do need more chalk. In fact, one and a half times as much chalk. Now you can see this where this is going, probably. I'm going to take away more and more and more. And if I do that, eventually, the amount of paint I'm going to need is three quarters times three quarters times three quarters times three quarters times three quarters, times three quarters forever. And I don't know if any of you have done infinite multiplications like that, but you might be able to see where this is going. It's going to end up with the amount of paint we need being zero because we take away all of the area eventually when we get to infinity. But the amount of chalk we need will end up being infinite. So we have a really weird shape here. Only shape you'll ever see like this probably or you've seen so far in your life. Most of you, it's called Sierpinski's gasket and it's got zero area, zero red paint, an infinite perimeter. How freaky is that? Um, so we don't need any red paint. Um, now, Pascal's triangle. Here it is, as a reminder. Let's paint it red since we've got all this spare red paint. And now we've painted it red, let's find the even numbers. And I'm going to put triangles around them. There's an even number, and then there's a little cluster of even numbers, and more, and more. And let's get rid of the even numbers, just leaving the odd numbers, and um, let's blur our eyes. Can you see? the pattern that is made by odd numbers in Pascal's triangle. That's really weird. In fact, as we zoom out, that's what Pascal's triangle looks like. Wow. Just the most amazing shape known as a fractal, the same shape repeating again and again and again. So odd numbers are red. How much red paint do we need? None. What's the correct answer? Amazingly, it is E, 0% to the nearest percent. I mean, I don't know if anyone guessed that, Sheila. It, it's totally counterintuitive. And I'll tell you why it's particularly counterintuitive. Because you'll be looking at it and saying, hang on a sec. I'm not blind. I can see all those ones. There's a million of those. And on the other side. So we've already got two million ones. And you're telling me there are no odd numbers. And it's true. There are all those odd numbers, but there are millions, to, well, you know, there's a huge factor more of even numbers. And by the time you get to a million rows, uh, the proportion of odd numbers is less than half a percent. By the time you get to an infinite number of rows, it's zero. I mean, how freaky is that? And this is where maths can sometimes take you into really weird world of the imagination because you can see odd numbers and yet maths is telling us Eventually, there will be no odd numbers at all in Pascal's triangle. Um, and uh, there is, for, for those of you doing higher 
uh, maths, you might want to know that there's ways of working out how many odd numbers, what proportion are going to be odd numbers. Um, with a, and there's a formula for approximating it at the top there, which looks a bit complicated, but that's just a, a, a rough guide to uh, where these numbers have come from. So when you've got one row in Pascal's triangle, it's just got a one in it. So 100% of the numbers are odd. By the time you get to 10 rows, which is pretty much what I showed you in my example, we're down to 70%. So that's why maybe people were saying two thirds will be odd, because that was the evidence I gave you. If I'd shown you 100 rows, You'd have said, oh, it's looking like it's heading towards a quarter. But by the time we get to a thousand, it's 10%. And then by the time we get to a million, it's less than 1%. So, wow, just completely counterintuitive. Um, and um, if you find that surprising, then you can kind of see what I'm talking about, this, this, this surprising side of maths. And you tend not to get tested on stuff like that. And that's partly because um, examiners don't like to trick you. And you might even think of these as trick questions. Of course, they're not trick questions, they're real questions. But most uh, curriculum exam questions are not, um, uh, are not of that style. But that's where some of the most interesting maths is. And of course, everything about your maths lessons is about getting the right answers. Uh, I'm sure that's how you think about it and who gets the most marks. Uh, and that's normally a good thing. You know, it's good to know that seven times eight is 56 and there's no other answer that I can think of that is legitimate. But here's the really weird thing. There are some sides of maths where actually getting it wrong is just as good and just as interesting. And partly when you get it wrong in some of the examples, like the examples I've shown you, um, it makes you say, why did I get it wrong? And it gives you a further insight into something, um, into where your brain works or just into the way that maths works. Um, and those are really good things. And sometimes that's what makes maths interesting. So don't feel in any way bad if like me, you scored zero out of four in that quiz. I suspect most of you did. If you did score more than zero, well done. If you got four out of four, I have failed because you know everything already. Um, so um, yeah, so that is... Um, that is formally all of the examples I have. There might well be some questions out there. Um, if you want to follow up on this kind of thing, two books that I wrote have got this sort of maths in there. This one I wrote with a friend of mine called Jeremy Wyndham. Uh, this is a new edition that's just come out. Uh, this one I wrote on my own. It's got quite a lot of surprises in it. Um, and there we go. Um, so I will stop sharing that screen if I can. Uh, and come back. So Sheila, I don't know if you've got any questions or if anyone, any teachers or students out there have got any questions for me, but uh, we got a, two or three minutes or uh, five minutes, we could. Yeah, what a fantastic uh, show. It really makes you think about maths in a different way. Um, I got them all wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> well I really enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, uh, do we have any questions from St. Mary's in Charleville? No. Did anyone get oh, any? Yeah. Did right? Oh, yeah. Did. Sorry. So, how do you get into that kind of maths? Ha. Huh. <laughs> good question. How do um? So when I was young, I was really into puzzles, as I mentioned, and I had a teacher when I was like ten who used to set us puzzles at lunchtime and I used to really enjoy that kind of thing um so uh I would say puzzles is a good way into it um of course it's finding puzzles that are hard enough but not too hard um uh for for older ones amongst you um I I one of the things I do is I edit the mathematical puzzle column in a magazine called New Scientist and there's a weekly puzzle there um and a lot of those puzzles are about trip, you know, surprises and everything else. So that's one, you know, little thing you could look up every week. Great thing is find out the answer the following week. Um, there are great collections of puzzles um, out there by people like Alex Bellos and David Wells. So that's one way. And then, on, and then through YouTube, things like Numberphile and other channels, which are often people picking out the surprising sides of maths. So, um, uh, so those are two, two routes. Uh, and your teachers may well have their own 
great ideas for for some different routes that they've and bit, bits of maths that they've really enjoyed as well thank you okay thank you uh do we have any question from drimna castle Okay, uh, if we have no question, we might wrap that up. Uh, Rob, just thank you so much. What a what an amazing set of puzzles. Um, when I the next time I go to play uh, basketball, I'm gonna think of it differently, and hopefully I'll hopefully take, I'll take get a score. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So th just to say, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Teachers, we have an event tonight at six thirty on Matt's Eyes, where where. Um, We'd be, we'd be encouraging people to take part in the Matt Size competition where students are encouraged to go out, uh, look at their environment and nature with their Matt Size. And we, the organisers will be giving guidelines on how to get involved and to get your class involved in the Matt Size uh, competition. So if you check out the details on the link, it's on mattsweek.ie. Uh, so once again, thank Rob, thank you so much. And for all the schools out there, we'll see you back here. Uh, same time, same place for Maths Week TV. Great, deadly, deadly silence. <laughs>